Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Warhammer 40k lore. Where today, due to the result of a poll held amongst my Patreon and Subscribe Star supporters, we are starting in on a new series 40k Fleet Tactics and Strategy. So the other two options, Grom the Pouch and Gene Stealers, are just going to have to wait a little longer. As today, we are going to have a look at the scale, the strategy, and the tactics of the Imperial Navy. Now, you may be wondering why I went out of my way to mention <laughs> scale there as well. Because make no mistake, for the Imperial Navy, its sheer mind-boggling size is absolutely a part of its strategy and tactics. In fact, it may very well be its foremost weapon, as no other faction in the 41st millennium come even close to having a fleet that can compare to the scope of the Imperial Navy. Not even remotely close. And to give you an idea here, <laughs> you'll have to excuse me, but um, GW's many challenges with military numbers is once again going to be rearing its ugly head on the horizon, as we do have a rough understanding of how large the Imperial Navy would be. This is due to the fact that we know that each and every sector within the Imperium is supposed to have its own battle fleet. Now the precise size of a sector, as we've talked about previously in the How the Imperium Defends Itself video, is a matter of considerable uncertainty. Some sectors are larger, some sectors are smaller, all dependent upon local reasons, administrative reasons, religious reasons, 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 reasons. But the average size, the intended size of a sector, is supposed to be around about 7 million cubic light years. Now that is certainly a pretty large number. <laughs> But in comparison to our entire galaxy, well, if we assume that our galaxy is relatively flat, so we don't have to take into account the entire galactic halo, then we're looking at about 8 trillion cubic light years. Or, in Imperial terms, that would be 1,142,857 sectors, each one of which is supposed to have a battle fleet consisting of 50 plus capital ships. <laughs> so before we even think about escorts or patrol class vessels, we have 50 times 1,142,857, or uh, 7,142,850 <laughs> capital vessels. Oh, oh, oi. <clears throat> uh, not only is the Imperial Navy the largest navy in 40k, it might just be the largest navy in science fiction history. Now, of course, this number isn't perfect. There are areas of the galaxy in which, of course, the Imperium has no sectors. There are areas of the galaxy in which no ships could possibly exist, like black holes, etc. Yet, even if we were to slice the number in half... Yeah. And uh, this is, of course, before we add in escorts and patrol vessels, etc. So, um, I think you get the point. The Imperial Navy is large. Very large. And it needs to be, because the Imperium is also very, very, very large. And it is constantly on the defensive. The moments when the Imperium is actually able to organize and launch an offensive, a massive Imperial Crusade, are few and far between meaning that it is the enemies of humanity that get to pick the battlefields, the when and the where. 
And whilst having a million capital vessels is all well and good, if the enemy chooses to attack some place where there's only one, the other 999,999 ships are de facto irrelevant. To try and circumvent this weakness, the Imperium has adopted the idea of a layered response strategy. I went into a lot more detail on this in my How the Imperium Defends Itself video, but the primary important part as it relates to the current topic is simply that the Imperium acts piecemeal. When a planet gets attacked, it sends out a distress signal. That distress signal is received by nearby worlds that begin sending reinforcements and also send out their own distress signal. If these distress signals reach other worlds without the signal having been countermanded, they too begin organizing reinforcements, and for every planet that receives the signal, the signal grows stronger and wider, bringing in yet further reinforcements from yet further afield. The Imperial Navy is of course a part of this piece-by-piece -piece proportionate response where the Imperium attempts to crush any potential threat with the minimum expenditure of resources, personnel, and material, so as to maintain maximum readiness for the next threat. Because of course in the 41st millennium, there is always a next threat. So how precisely does the Imperial Navy do this, seeing as it is going to have to work in a bit more of a microcosm compared to the entirety of the Imperium? They can't just dispatch entire battle fleets willy-nilly whenever a planet cries wolf after all. Especially as it is a lucky sector indeed that only has to deal with one wolf at a time. Even the most placid and peaceful Imperial Sector is rife with all kinds of trouble. Pirates, heretical infiltrators, smugglers, Xenos raiders, etc, etc clog every single solitary space lane 24-7, and the Imperial Navy has got to deal with the vast majority of it as local planetary space defense forces will only deal with their immediate area, usually orbit or at the very most the local solar system. Everything beyond that, and usually that as well, is Imperial Navy territory. And now suddenly you begin to realize that that seemingly absurdly massive number from earlier is actually really goddamn tiny. Let's say you've got 50 capital ships in a sector. Let's say that each of these comes with a solid 20 to 30 escorts. Let's take the bigger number, shall we? 1,550 warships all told. These now have to patrol an area of 7 million cubic light years. Now, thank the Emperor, the majority of that is dead, empty, cold void that nobody really needs to bother guarding. Primarily, the Imperial Navy's responsibility will be the trade lanes and the stable warp routes from one planet to another. This can lead to a wide variety of challenges as well. Some solar systems may have nice stable warp routes that enter on the outer edges of the solar system. whoop did you Put a couple of massive ass radar antennas on nearby planets or even on satellites nearby and voila, you've got yourself a pretty damn good security net. Anyone that's popping out of the warp nearby will be detected and quickly identified, or otherwise considered to be something sneaky and unhospitable wandering into the system. In other areas, however, the exit to the warp lane itself might be hilariously enormous and encompass nearly an entire half of a solar system. Now you've got a harder time keeping track of things. In other areas again, you've got various disturbances, electromagnetic storms, the presence of asteroid fields, etc, etc, etc. 
Some areas might even have such massive warp disturbances that any real travel via warp is damn near impossible and reserved only for the highest priority official business, meaning that the planet's trade in whatever it might be will have to arrive entirely via non-warp means, meaning that you'll have thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of real space freighters moving back and forth between planets. This is a massive part of the Imperium's economy that isn't talked about all that often. Obviously, within a solar system you'll have all kinds of transports wandering about, but even between solar systems there are real space freighters that move back and forth. These are usually very large so as to carry the maximum amount of cargo, and well, they turn on their engines and burn in the rough direction of their destination at maximum thrust until they reach the halfway point, after which they flip on over and burn at maximum thrust in the reverse to slow themselves down again. It's a simple principle and even regular engine spacecrafts can reach pretty goddamn ridiculous speeds by doing this, but even then it is a very slow means of travel, and usually the majority if not the entirety of the crew are stowed away in cold sleep containers or stasis containers during the voyage. But of course if a planet needs X amount of grain and the ship can only carry so much and it's so very very slow, the only way to get around this problem is to dispatch multiple ships. And again, due to the slowness of the travel, they could be arriving with manifests decades old if not potentially centuries in the worse off case scenarios necessitating a ridiculous amount of stupid ass paperwork for the Imperial Navy to check all of these vessels, or at least they should be checking them. Again, a lot of this will probably be left over to local authorities. And this is just one of the challenges that faces the Imperial Navy on just the civilian front before we even move on to warfare. Pirates is another one. Now, space travel in 40k is relatively difficult and relatively rare. You need very large ships that are very expensive to produce and mostly made by hyper-specialized personnel. Therefore, piracy is again not unheard of, but relatively rare, and when it happens it tends to not be warships but rather civilian transports, freighters or merchantmen that have decided that it's way more profitable to simply take shit rather than sell it. In the grand scheme of things, these are practically no threat at all. They're going to be a minor inconvenience to local trade at worst, and by and large their best defense is that the Imperial Navy just isn't going to care about them in the slightest. When they get a moment to deal with them, the pirates' careers tend to be short and very very bloody, as a converted merchantman is not going to have the weaponry to fight off even an Imperial escort, and it's certainly not going to have the technology to hide from it either. What is considerably worse, of course, would be Xenos pirates and raiders. These are a hell of a lot worse, first and foremost because they do have the technology both to potentially hide from Imperial patrols and also maybe just maybe outfight them. You're not going to be sending just a couple of escorts after confirmed Eldar pirates, for example. Now, how does the Imperial Navy deal with this? Well, via task forces. Usually, the majority of a battle fleet's strength will be gathered in a handful of areas. These will usually be around highly industrialized planets, preferably with sizable orbital shipyards, allowing the vessels to remain at high anchor comfortably, quietly, and with the minimum expenditure of manpower and resources, and allowing them to run their reactors at the minimum level, making them as safe as possible as well. Because whilst this is standardized technology, uh, plasma engines the size of cities are always a, a pinch dodgy, so if you can avoid running them over much, you'll probably pick that latter option. 
and the majority of business isn't going to require a battleship or a grand cruiser or a battle cruiser either. Say, for example, that we've got piratical activity and the local space defense forces are not up to the task of dealing with it. In these cases, a single cruiser might be dispatched with a couple squadrons of escorts. Now, a cruiser might not sound like a lot, but bear in mind that even a single lunar class cruiser is 5 kilometers long and carries enough torpedoes and lands batteries to destroy virtually any other non-capital ship in the galaxy. Unless the pirates are particularly heavily armed, in which case it's probably more of a raid or invasion fleet than pirates, then a lunar class is more than enough. In fact, in most cases it would be considered hilarious overkill. But its massive sensor and all specs suites will make it far easier to detect the enemy. And along with a nice big net of Imperial escorts as well, they will be able to locate pirates far more easily than small system patrol crafts. They'll also be able to cover a lot more ground, as one of the main defenses of pirates, beyond simply being ignored, is of course to stay hidden. And that's going to be a lot more difficult with two dozen warships hunting you down. Of course, again, there is a wide variety in the nature of pirates. If we're closer to the Eye of Terror, for example, pirates tend to be far more heavily armed and armoured, and a single cruiser might not do the job anymore. In which case, the Imperial Navy's response will still be the same, but scaled differently. Maybe instead of one cruiser, there'll be two of them. Maybe they'll start operating in pairs, which is a standard tactic for the Lunar class cruisers, for example. Maybe they'll send four, or six, or eight, etc., along with however many escorts are required per ship, to make damn sure that the pirates will not be able to outgun them and turn the tables, since of course if a warship is lost to pirates, not only have you failed killing the pirates, you've given them a new ship to play with. And the Imperial Navy's response to an actual invasion, too, is not all that different from how they deal with pirates. Let's have a hypothetical scenario. Let's say that orcs are invading an Imperial sector. But first and foremost, they're striking at simply one solar system, with a relatively small armada, the vanguard of a much larger force. All right. The system patrol ships are unable to deal with it, and so they send out a distress call. This is picked up by nearby worlds, which relay the distress call, until it begins reaching the first elements of the Imperial Navy. Their immediate first task might be to gather up reinforcement troops, Imperial Guard troops, for example, herd them onto transport ships and begin heading in the direction of the sound of gunfire. This is a major operation in and of itself, since you're going to need to organize Imperial Guard regiments, you're going to need to load them onto transports. These transports need to be located and moved into the system sending the reinforcements. The transport themselves are of course going to be almost entirely helpless, and are as such going to have to be escorted with a variety of vessels. If it's a small raiding force, then the Imperial Navy probably wouldn't even be involved in sending reinforcements, but in that case it might be a cruiser and a couple squadrons of escorts. If it is a major invasion requiring a straight-up counter-invasion, you might see a bit of a battle group, perhaps led by one of the heavier elements, like a grand cruiser or a battle cruiser, for example, with its own escort of one or two smaller cruisers with then yet further the escorts surrounding that force again. Now, more often than not, this is not going to be the case when it comes to the invasion of a single world, because by Imperial standards, that is considered a goddamn skirmish. No, not even a skirmish, it's a, a light exchange of gunfire along the periphery, that's all. Even if the world is burnt to the ground as a result, the simple fact is it takes the Imperium so long to respond to a threat that if a planet can't hold off the initial invasion by itself, 
it's unlikely to get any help in the time it takes the invader to overcome it. Basically, if it's just one planet under attack, either it'll be strong enough to resist by itself, which is often the case, or it'll be overrun by a massively superior force. Because again, it takes a long time to organize anything, especially on this scale. You need to get the Imperial Guard regiments ready. If you don't have any standing Imperial Guard forces, you're going to need to raise them from the various planets in the area. That alone is going to take months. Then you're going to have to train them, yet further months. Then you're going to have to call in Imperial Navy transports, which depending upon availability could take months, if not years, or in some more extreme cases, decades, then you're also going to need the escorts, of course, which again, depending on how busy the rest of the sector is, well, if it's just one planet under attack, odds are they're just not gonna care, frankly. But in our hypothetical scenario, let's say that the planet got lucky, and a nearby solar system not only has a handful of Imperial Guard regiments that have just been raised, and were being readied to ship out to a different battlefield. The transports are right there, the Imperial Navy escort is right there as well, as it receives the distress signal. Alright, well, uh, we need to do something, we've got troops ready and standing by, so might as well dispatch them. In which case, the transports will form the heart of the flotilla, which will be surrounded surrounded by all sides, by escorts and potentially the cruiser if it's joining in. At this point, the Imperial Navy's sole responsibility is the delivery of the Imperial Guard and the safe guarding, of course, of the delivery itself. Thus, if something goes terribly wrong, like the invasion force turns out to be much, much, much larger than anticipated, the Navy elements are unlikely to hang around and actually fight the enemy, they are simply an escort. Now a more aggressive and or zealous commander might decide to uh, take his chances regardless, and maybe pick away at the enemy and try to form a distraction maybe, allowing the transports to break through, or perhaps launching a skirmishing campaign against the invaders. A lot of Imperial warships are quite well suited to skirmishing as they tend to carry a lot of torpedoes or long range lancers. Hit and run tactics are absolutely a part of the Imperium's arsenal, even if their ships are not necessarily always ideally suited to it. Having all of your engines mounted in one massive rearward facing block, for example, it can make retreats a um, hazardous undertaking. More likely though, the fleet will begin retreating, with its transports in tow probably, and report back that the enemy is too big to be engaged at the current time. And unless there is some very pressing reason to try regardless of the odds, like a uh, super important planet being attacked for example, the fleet will probably be authorized to withdraw, and then it will be rescaled to meet the enemy. In our case, let's say that the orc invasion is, uh, is fairly sizable, definitely more than a single world that can handle. We're talking uh, several kill cruisers and tons of little orcish vessels. Maybe even a big old rook at the back providing fighter and bomber support, or fighter and bomber, <laughs> I do suppose. In these cases, what would the Imperial Navy do? Well, ideally, it would like to deal with the invaders quickly and decisively via deploying overwhelming force. Unfortunately, the strain of having to defend a vast area of space rarely makes this possible. This tends to be a strategy adopted mostly by crusading fleets, where the Imperium can decide when and where to fight, and can bring to bear absolutely overwhelming crushing force with battleships, grand cruisers, heavy cruisers, etc. to smash apart the enemy in one single decisive battle. In a sector, however, especially under attack by a still relatively small orcish force, the big boys would be held back in case something even worse began happening. 
In the case of a relatively large-scale fleet engagement, the Imperial Navy would probably make one of their larger vessels into the flagship. A grand cruiser, for example, or maybe a battle cruiser, something mid-weight, in between the cruiser and the actual battleship. This would then be given an escort of two to four light cruisers to provide immediate protection, and then again each of these ships would be provided with escort squadrons of whatever frigate class ships are available. If this new formation, in the opinion of the commanding admiral, is enough to engage and destroy the enemy, then the fleet will enter into a good old fashioned kill, crush and destroy mode, seeking a decisive engagement to wipe out the opposition forces cleanly. If it's still not enough, the Imperial Navy will be withdrawn again and rescaled up to meet the threat, with further capital ships and battleships being released to deal with it. If enough ships are available, that is, because this is where we run into the usual problem with all of this. More often than not, there simply won't be enough available reserves to well, meet the kind of force required to outright destroy an enemy. In most scenarios, the battle fleets of a specific sector will be pulled and pushed in a hundred different ways at any given time, meaning that commanders will have to make do with whatever can be allocated to them. If a pitched decisive battle is not possible, by the way we will get to how exactly the Imperial Navy prefers to fight at the end of the video as we are talking strategy first, and as we all know, masters study logistics, amateurs study tactics. <laughs> Anywho, this would mean that the Imperial Navy would have to engage in some sort of uh, less than noble and honourable warfare. Hit and run tactics are yet again an option, and with a larger fleet the scale and scope of these tactics can of course be expanded. On several occasions, the war has ended up in such a way that the Imperial Navy controls a certain side of a system, or even a certain part of a planet, whilst the enemy commands the other, with neither side being willing to attack because they would have to move out into space and expose themselves first, basically with both parties hiding behind the planet that they are trying to take and or defend. Positioning can become surprisingly important in space battles very very quickly, as whilst there is no high and or low ground, command over large areas of asteroid fields for example, or entire planets can give considerable advantages to one side or the other, both in terms of immediate concealment and cover and manoeuvrability as gravity slinging around worlds is a practice often used by both the Imperium and its enemies. Now, fleet battles that last for a long time are unlikely to be decided in a single big old gunline clash, rather it will be a far more gradual process with both sides jockeying for position and advantage, especially if it's a drawn out conflict where both sides might require reinforcements, rearmament and various supplies. In these instances, it's not the enemy fleet that becomes the main target, but rather their freighters, their transport, their merchantmen, and their rear line supplies. You can imagine the amount of shit it takes to keep a army capable of invading a planet running. It, uh, it can be quite a lot. Let's for example look at something I've already covered, the Siege of Vrax. Initially, the Imperial Navy sent a whole host of ships to make sure that supplies arrived, make sure that the fleet transports arrived on Vrax, etc. But as the conflict wore on and on and on and no fleet threats emerged, the guard forces grew smaller and smaller and smaller, until they could barely protect the constant reinforcement and supply drops that were scuttling back and forth between scuttling, shuttling back and forth between Vrax and Krieg and that almost ended the entire campaign as well. Since when the fleet threat did arrive, it uh, caused a great deal of problems. And the Imperial Navy might be trying to create those precise same problems for an invader attacking an Imperial world, whilst trying to make sure that the opposition can't do the same to them.
In these kinds of scenarios, the heaviest ships, the battleships, grand cruisers, etc., might be hanging back somewhere relatively safe in the shadow of a planet, making sure that they can't become the victims of a sudden enemy move or some sort of sneak attack. Whilst the smaller ships, the escorts, engage in de facto piracy behind the enemy lines, perhaps commanded by a cruiser or two here and there, whilst other light elements, like again, cruisers and escorts take care of protecting their own rear lines. These kinds of high space standoffs can last for years, for decades even, or centuries, as we saw in another conflict I covered, the War for Badab. That was on a much larger scale, of course, but the two sides for literally centuries contended themselves with sniping at one another's rear supply lines via piratical actions. And in many cases, this is what the Imperium wants. If it can tie down a war front for de facto ever by dispatching one major capital ship and a handful of escorts, yay! <laughs> That's one enemy advance stopped, isn't it? With the minimum expenditure of forces. And in a perfect world, this stalemate would eventually be broken by further Imperial reinforcements relieved from other battlefronts that are done dealing with their own decade-old stalemates. This, incidentally, is also one of the reasons why the Imperial Navy is so often tied down to such a ridiculous degree, because if you're dealing with 12 attacks at the same time, you might actually just hope that you can tie down all 12 and then pray that at some point, in a future far, far beyond the present, you might be able to shift over enough reinforcements to deal with one of them. Maybe you could even start a bit of a domino effect where you can then take on the next and the next, or more likely, there'll be another three enemy invasions. But, assuming the stalemate can at some point be broken, how does the Imperial Navy go about actually fighting a battle? Well, the Imperial Navy is actually a rather flexible force when it comes to the ways and means in which it can engage enemies, as it carries a considerable variety of weaponry that can be used at long, medium, and close range. In fact, one of the largest Imperial ships, the Emperor-class battleship, is not really a battleship at all, but more of a carrier as it carries enormous quantities of attack craft with which to assail the enemy. And the attack crafts, too, are a rather interesting little thing, as they are not what we would normally view as, uh, you know, space fightery things, little one-man bombers or fighters. Instead, they are pretty damn massive spacecraft in their own right. For example, the Fury Interceptor. Now, being a simple fighter, you'd think it'd be a relatively small ship, right? Well, it's actually around 70 meters long with a crew of four. By comparison, the B-17 bomber of World War II was 22 meters long. It's bloody enormous, and it is so enormous because it carries a huge engine and a massive weapons load including racks of anti-starship missiles intended to be used against enemy fighters, and bank upon bank upon bank of LAS cannons. Meaning that the Fury Interceptor, when deployed in sufficient numbers, would even be a threat to frigates and smaller escorts. And if the Intercept fighter can sink escort-class vessels, what do you think the bomber can do? The bombers are even more hilariously massive, with crews of up to 15 people, carrying 10 or more anti-ship missiles and 40 plasma bombs designed to cripple capital-class vessels. And these can be deployed in their hundreds and in their thousands, in enormous clouds of ridiculously lethal vessels. Honestly, considering the firepower that these attack crafts boast, I'm wondering why the Imperium even bothers with regular weaponry. 
Or, well, actually, no, it's easy to explain. It's because it looks bloody awesome. A tremendous line of monstrous warships cruising through the void in all their majesty, with cannons the size of city blocks vomiting forth huge shells at the enemy, whilst fat beams of burning lasers reach out across to pop the soap bubble void shields of hostile craft. It is an aesthetic that is very difficult to give up, isn't it? And, of course, it is the favoured tactic of the Imperial Navy, the good old line of battle, though in space terms it would probably be more akin to the wall of battle, with multiple lines of warships all of concentrating their firepower on the enemy's ships on the opposite side. And over the centuries and the millennium, the Navy has perfected this way of warfare, and their basic tactics and doctrine are applied on every level of naval engagements beyond the skirmishing of frigates and escorts. For example, if a line of cruisers were to give battle to an enemy, they would operate in much the same way that a line of battleships or grand cruisers or battle cruisers would, in that they would approach the enemy with their bows pointed straight towards them. This is for three reasons. The first is to close with the enemy as quickly as possible, so as to bring to bear whatever weaponry the fleet has in the greatest quantity that are the most effective. These could be lance batteries, in which case the fleet would break away at a relatively long range and begin pounding the enemy with their concentrated lancers. Or, if macro cannon batteries are the order of the day, they will move in considerably closer, more along the lines of medium to close range, and open fire with full broadsides. Alternatively, in particularly large and complex battles, there might be multiple lines engaging at various distances covering one another's advance. The more macro cannon heavy ships rushing ahead to engage the enemy as night fighting rangers, whilst lance battery beams cross the void above them to provide cover and early engagement. The second reason why the Imperial Navy tends to simply charge at the enemy is so that they can deploy their torpedoes, which are housed in massive forward-firing heavily armoured tubes. And Imperial torpedoes are, um, big. The size of skyscrapers, actually, and carry ridiculous warheads capable of outright obliterating vessels should they hit, but hitting the enemy is actually more of a secondary concern. Obviously, if the torpedoes end up impacting on a target, whoop de doo No complaints. However, their primary purpose is actually to restrict an enemy's movement along the lines of of minefields, for example, in the First and Second World War. You weren't necessarily hoping that the enemy would simply march into the minefield and so sustain casualties, rather you wanted to direct the areas in which they could operate by saying, no, there are mines here, so you're gonna have to attack over there instead. This usage of torpedoes is done primarily due to the limitations of the weapons themselves. First and foremost, they are fired at very, very long ranges, even by spaceship standards, so even the slowest, biggest, most bumbling vessel will have plenty of time to get out of the way, to plot firing solutions to intercept the torpedo, or to deploy their own attack crafts to destroy them on approach. Furthermore, the torpedoes are not very bright. They are guided by a rudimentary and uh, supposedly highly aggressive machine spirit, which is essentially a massive-ass radar, one would guess, that is certainly capable of scanning a fairly large area in front of it. It is also capable of changing its trajectory and locking onto enemy ships via a decent variety of targeting measures. 
There are mentions, for example, of heat seeking, of finding energy signatures, of looking out for visual signatures. There are even suggestions that some of them, the more advanced types, can detect the minute fluctuations in gravetic fields to determine where a ship is in space. Fairly high tech, really, but again, the problem is the sheer quantity of space you are trying to cover. You could have a search cone 100 kilometers wide and still not have a chance in hell at hitting something at a range of 2,000 kilometers. But again, the missiles don't even have to hit anything to be valuable. Let us say that the enemy has established themselves in a very favorable position. They're already deployed, they've got their battle lines ready, and they'd be able to gun you down as you charge at them with overwhelming firepower. Well, a nice big fat brace of torpedoes later, and the enemy can either choose to move or get their asses kicked and the opposition fleet is going to have to be damned confident in their point defenses and intercepting fighters if they're going to take the risk of getting hit by cyclonic torpedoes used to destroy planets. The torpedoes are also, as mentioned, a handy tool for cutting off certain areas of the battlefield making sure that the enemy have to remain gentlemanly and line up opposite for a good old-fashioned exchange of firepower, rather than doing something gay like scattering out in a wide net to fire at the incoming fleet from all around, for example. Because while space battles are theoretically fought in three dimensions, that's only true if you fail to fill the third dimension with titanic explosives. And of course, the third reason why the Imperial Navy is quite the hard charger is because those huge massive prows, inside of which the torpedoes are housed, are literally a few hundred meters of reinforced armor and shock absorbers. The Imperium is very confident that in a straight up slugging match, it can endure anything the enemy can throw at them until the battle line is ready to heave to and pound back with their own broadsides at their preferred range. This also plays into the Imperial Navy's doctrine of attempting to engage in decisive battles whenever possible. Space wars, as we have mentioned already, can drag on for a ridiculous amount of time, and it is very difficult to find and track down an enemy in the void of the 41st millennium, especially when you take into consideration the ability to travel through the warp, and how downright impossible it is to track and follow such movements. When you've got the opposition across from you, then you want to make sure you can crush or cripple them outright in one single battle. Because at the end of the day, the Imperium can sustain practically any casualties you can throw at it. Even if the Imperial battle fleet is destroyed, eh, there's more where that came from. And the potential gain of destroying an enemy's fleet is simply too valuable to pass up. It is one less needle prick in the Imperium's side. It is one less threat. It is one less diversion from the important duty of guarding the sector. And the deeper into the enemy's engagement zone you can charge before turning and presenting your own weaponry, the more difficult it will be for them to disengage and flee. Now, you may have noticed I've also been a bit vague on the precise details of the weaponry, how they're employed and how they uh, work upon the opposition. That's because we don't know. <laughs> I know that sounds very, very stupid, but 40k has a very big problem in that its Void War changes drastically depending upon which author is currently writing it. In some instances, Void War is a very slow and steady grinding process, where ships spend 
hours closing with one another, firing off multiple torpedo salvos to prepare the battlefield and exchange strike craft fire in huge waves and furballs in between the two fleets before anyone gets within their actual weapon ranges. When that finally happens, macro cannon batteries shoot out huge clouds of enormous projectiles that equally so take many 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 minutes to actually reach the enemy. Even lance weaponry can take minutes to reach the opposing side. In this kind of battle, the ships are constantly engaged in little jukes and jives within their own lines, as even a minute adjustment in direction, a tiny degree change on the main engines, can push a ship hundreds if not thousands of meters from where it was originally at. Imagine a warship travelling at a thousand odd kilometers pushed by titanic engines. A single degrees change in its propulsion will move it way out of the way of where you first aimed your shot at, meaning that the various vessels need to fire massive salvos at one another, explaining the need for proper broadside combat in the 41st millennium. Void shields too are capable of taking ridiculous pounding, absorbing huge barrages and barely feeling it. Battleships can sustain tremendous amount of punishment and simply keep on going. Even if their void shields are destroyed, they have meters upon meters upon meters upon meters of armor, with thousands of damage control crews and tech priests on the ready to carry out emergency repairs and keep the ship fighting. In this style, naval engagements would probably take hours at the very least, maybe even days or weeks to engage and disengage. This is definitely my preferred type of naval engagement because they feel epic, massive, and justifies the need for employing, well, weapons the size of small cities rather than just swamping one another with clouds of attack craft. And then another author steps in and goes, oh no, that battleship, it just disappeared because it was hit by one salvo of weapons fire. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's just, boom, it's gone. <laughs> Just like on some other instances, um, like in Badab, for example, we have descriptions of it taking days and days and days for a fleet to exit the stable warp point and then move in towards the enemy planet, which would make the preparations for these huge battles very feasible. In other instances, they arrive right on top of the defense and invade almost immediately, giving no warning to anyone. Yeah, this is the problem with 40k space combat. I've described the tactics and the wider strategy, but when it comes to the actual cut and thrust of it, <laughs> your guess is honestly about as good as mine. As fighting primarily seems to be concerned with the, uh, the pace of the plot rather than the pace of weapons fire. For example, this is one of the reasons why Astartes boarding actions is a thing. Think now for a second. If ships can just get blown out of the sky in a nano instance from a single barrage of weapons fire, why would you ever board anything? My god, the risk to your men, the risk to space marines! You're not gonna blow up an enemy ship with a hundred marines aboard? Jesus Christ, that'd be, that'd be ridiculous. At the same time, you can't afford to just stop shooting at that ship in the enemy battle line, which is still pounding the ever-living crap out of you. It's not like the marines will be able to knock out all of the weapons, the fire control, the bridge, the engines, etc. Considering these ships are kilometers long, with thousands upon thousands of naval armsmen aboard, you'd have to either board it and then sit there getting your shit kicked in, or risk exploding the entire enemy ship along with your brave boarders. Hmm, bit of a problem there as you can see. And this, this gets stupid on some occasions. Uh, during the Horus Heresy, for example, I remember Horus Lupercal, the goddamn war master himself, choosing to board enemy vessels currently actively engaged in fighting the rest of his navy. 
It's like, oh, yeah, either we just get our shit kicked or we blow up the boss. It's a bit of a difficult choice, really. Now, of course, you could argue that they'd pick different targets and so on, sure, but even then, a boarding action would take a lot longer than simply just blowing up the enemy ship. Whereas if you go with my preferred way of void combat, where engagements can take hours, then now suddenly boarding actions actually make a great deal of sense. Even if you stop focusing on one enemy vessel, it's not going to deal any, you know, immediately cataclysmic damage to you in the time it might take to board it and invade it and get to valuable areas. In fact, in this case, a hundred space marines would probably cut their way to a reactor core a hell of a lot quicker than you overloading those void shields. So, you'll have to excuse me uh, for the lack of detail when it comes to the actual the boom and the bang here, because, again... Your guess, probably as good as mine. Anywho, I'm gonna wrap this video up here. So, until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon with more videos. And uh, I'll probably do more votes for my supporters as well, because that seems fun. Have a good day.